Hello everyone, it is time for yet another hour of Markna! So this is speaker number nine, but first I want to thank Reef Nutrition for being a sponsor of today's event. I love using their food in my tanks, they ship it everywhere, they make tons of it. They have all different kinds for different size mouths. Uh, Arctopods is one of my favorites, uh, hands down, because I can just squirt it in the tank and the Antheus gobble it up. And I really, and I've been using their food for a super long time. And of course, they make really good batches of phytoplankton with, you know, combination blends you can count on. And that's all good stuff for your reef. Um, I wanted to also mention to you that, no, we still have no electricity. We did open the doors front and back, so you may hear some background sound, but uh, we had to get a little bit of cross breeze because the humidity of my reef tank baking in this hot house was not helping us survive whatsoever. Our next guest is Dr. Kevin Erickson, who is a marine ornamental pathobiologist and biosecurity specialist. I mean, oh my God, how did I get this guy on this channel? He sounds super important. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for doing this. And uh, you're, I know you're going through a lot over there. So if you guys are watching this, make sure to subscribe to Mark's channel because he's uh, going, going through a lot trying to produce this uh, live. Yeah, well done. Oh, let me add um, the raffle. The link is in every video description. I've been pasting it every single time. If you, I don't know if you guys noticed. I know they've been putting it in the chat, but it's in the description too. You can click it. We've raised $4,800 for Coral Restoration Foundation so far, and we still have, uh, I don't know, 12 and a half more speakers because one's in front of us. So, <laughs> or whatever the math is. I can't do math on camera. I get super nervous. But um, we have an opportunity to raise money, and all those tickets you're buying gives you a chance to win these different prizes. And then I'm shipping them all out to you next week as best I can. I mean, there's going to be a lot of packages. I'm going to be, I don't even know how I'm going to get them to the car. But anyway, especially the car that got crushed by a tree. But anyway, I'll figure it out. You'll get your stuff. You have something to look forward to. Kevin, I'm going to put your presentation on here and not waste any of your time. Um, is there anything else we need before we get into that? <laughs> no, no. Thank you very much. But I'm, back on I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have a Macna 2023 shirt on. Had I known, I would have worn my, my Markna 2023 sh shirt on. I'm sorry. You need an R oh, right no. there, right there. Yeah, I need an R <laughs> right, right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so great. All right, so here.
publish first of all. Okay, hey. guys, can you hear me? Um, I'm going to let Kevin rewind a little bit here. And it looks like... I know, I'm checking. Okay. So I'm on... Kevin, can you say something, please? Can I say something, please? Hello, everybody in the chat. Can you hear us? Yeah. All right, so that's it. So did we didn't get any of this, I am assuming, you just from the very beginning. I am so sorry. Let's do this again like we're doing it live for the first time. <laughs> All right. Let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. Let me rewind mine as well. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Hello, okay, everybody in the good. future who's watching this on the live stream. Working. Hi, everybody. Yes. Good stuff. All right. I'm Kevin Erickson. I'm a marine biologist. I've been inter interested in uh, marine aquariums and their operation, livestock, uh, design, and science uh, for about 20 years, as well as interested in marine diseases and, and how those uh, diseases spread around the world. So I've been in the, in the hobby since 2004. Uh, and during that time, I've lived in nine countries and worked in public and private aquariums and science centers around the world. Next slide, please. Uh, so during all that time, many of you have known me, at least for the last 10 years, if not longer. Uh, I've been doing a lot of education in the background. I uh, started uh, with a BS in marine biology, went to the aquarium science uh, uh, college out in uh, Oregon, and then did a couple certificates, uh, and then a master's degree in aquatic pathobiology, and finally a PhD here in Australia, uh, where I live today in marine biosecurity of ornamental fish. Next slide, please. Uh, so during that time as well, I've worked a, a lot of different jobs. Um, and the top right there is me as a director of a marine science center in California on Catalina Island, uh, where I had to collect all the animals, including that large California sea hare there. Uh, but I've worked, like I said, in public and private aquariums. I've been a public uh, and private aquarium designer, a hovercraft pilot, all sorts of uh, uh, cartography and water quality analyst. I've been a sports radio announcer. Huh. Uh, and then finally, and most recently, as a marine biologist. Uh, Which slide, sport? Please. Which sport? Oh my gosh! Uh, football, American football, uh, oh, wow. basketball, and baseball. Yeah, all the different ones. Some of them I didn't even know how to. Uh, I didn't even know the rules. So I, wow. yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so many of you know me from my previous job. Uh, we just heard from Travis right before this. Uh, thank you, Travis, so, so much for uh, taking up the position as Masna president. Uh, so I was uh, first involved in uh, Masna in 2010. Uh, so two, 2010 to 2011, I was the director at large, and then I actually. When I moved here to Australia, I was uh, appointed and then elected as vice president. And, and then when the uh, president left, I uh, was appointed uh, and then elected as president. And then finally, um, as, uh, as Masna and Macman grew, I was the CEO from 2016 to 2022. And some of you have seen me on stage over the years uh, wearing my big hat. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you to Jim last year for, uh, for uh, bidding and winning that hat. I hope you're wearing it right now. Next slide, please. <laughs> That's funny. So <laughs> So during that time, uh, while being a professional uh, marine biologist and working in the aquarium industry, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world, I, mean, I learned a couple of things. And, and those points are that the marine ornamental fish industry, it transcends borders. It's a global industry. And I believe that more effort needs to be taken to ensure that the diseases and invasive organisms uh, do not transcend these same borders. Um, aquarium professionals and hobbyists can take easy uh, steps uh, to reduce the disease transfer, not only in their own aquarium, but not only between stores, not between club members, but between states and between international borders as well. Next slide, please. So I saw this need around the world to prevent the diseases and parasites, uh, both within the countries. And so uh, during my master's degree, I thought to myself, wow, you know what, I can actually do something about this and I can potentially get a PhD about it. And I contacted uh, people around the world and I ended up here in Australia. And so I use Australia as a model to kind of, uh, with a global border and fortunately no land borders and really kind of relatively easy to be able to quantify and calculate the disease that comes into the country and how it moves around the country. There are little puns in my slide. So those of you who aren't familiar with that photo, that is a fish tank. Next yeah, slide, I saw it. <laughs> it's great. Uh, so here in Australia, um, this is uh, data as of about uh, 2014, 2015, but Australia uh, um, still to this day is one of the leading countries in national biosecurity protection. Uh, so also in Australia, um, uh, there's about 14,000, 15,000, maybe up to, excuse me, 1,400 to 1,600 uh, known fish species uh, in Australia, but as, uh, in the global trade, that is. But in Australia, we have about uh, 255. Um, in, as of 2012, we were only allowed to import uh, what are wild collected, not aquaculture fish from 26 countries. And when those fish come into the country, uh, they're uh, put through a seven-day quarantine period. Next slide, please. 
So once those fish come into the country, um, little is known about the path that those marine ornamental organisms take once they're allowed into the country. Um, First-hand accounts of these imported organisms, which are basically just fish, uh, are that these fish have disease and parasites beyond the seven-day period that they're going through quarantine. Um, these could have uh, detrimental effects to the local collected animals because these imported animals then mix with the locally collected animals in the supply chain once they're released from quarantine. Uh, I think those slides are of Cannes Marine. Those, rather, those pictures are of Cannes Marine a couple okay. of years ago now. Uh, to give you an idea of kind of the complexity of marine supply chains, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is a picture... Uh, out of a 20, uh, 2007 report. On the left there, I know it's a kind of small, on the left there you have, uh, this is North Bali, uh, this is as of 2007, you had nine collection areas, uh, mm -hmm. and those nine collection areas were being kind of collected from by six different villagers, uh -huh. or six different villages, um, and then those six different villages were then selling to 58 traders in the third column, wow. and then those 58 traders were then selling to 27 exporters. So when we say your animal comes from a country, it has been in touch with potentially every other animal uh, or at least two degrees removed from every other animal potentially in the supply chain, not only during that time, but potentially before. Uh, next slide. Wow. So here in Australia, when those animals land, uh, in order to protect the national uh, borders, uh, there's a couple of different steps and we'll go through those now. So you as a hobbyist might go to a store and that store will receive a purchase order and they say, well, I don't have this organism in stock. So they have to go find this organism in stock. And that's what that red arrow is to the right. It says, oh, locate the appropriate or ornamental organism. Uh, then they find it. And you go to step two next. Uh, and so then that exporter or sorry, that store needs to contact an exporter potentially overseas. And that exporter has to get an export certificate of health for that animal to be able to bring it into Australia, assuming it's all on the list of allowed countries. And if they can't find one for that animal, they have to go back then and find an appropriate animal and go through that step again. At that point, that animal is able to leave if you get an export uh, uh, health certificate and you go to the next slide. And when that uh, fish lands in Australia, it's actually not in the country yet. It needs to go through that quarantine period. Uh, and it, when it hits Australia, it goes through a visual inspection. And during that initial visual inspection, it will say, oh, yep, okay, we have to put it through the seven day quarantine period. And if it, it's uh, good enough and it passes, it can go to the next step. And if it's not good enough, it will go on to be rejected or destroyed. And then the whole process has to start all over again. Hmm. And then we go to step four, which is already there. Um, once it passes, uh, it goes through that seven-day quarantine period. It might need additional quarantine, uh, and the, the loop will continue and continue and continue until that uh, quarantine inspector says yes, and then you finally enter the country, and then you go to the next one, and then it's available for sale, wow. and then that animal is available to you. And so this is where my PhD work in 2012 to 2017 started. So we'll go on to the next slide here. This is ultimately what I found with my PhD as of uh, 2014. There were 48 importers of aquatic uh, animals into the country, which are mostly just fish. Uh, there were 215 marine aquarium businesses, and there were about uh, 19,000 marine aquarium hobbyists. So on the left is the, the kind of the complex uh, interactions of on the top, those approved foreign exporters allowing their fish into the country. That's the process we just went through in the last slide. And they come into two central areas. That's the import wholesaler. That's that kind of left green arrow. And uh, it goes into an import retailer. And so what I did for my PhD are those kind of two bigger boxes on gray boxes on the left. I surveyed all of the business uh, businesses in Australia. And I served all, uh, surveyed all of the hobbyists in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find out two things. I wanted, if you go to the next uh, uh, point there, outcome of the PhD, basically, uh, I found that there was a 1.83% chance of a marine ornamental organism that was uh, not only imported, but a domestic one, domestically collected one, making it back into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And that was done through a analysis of the trade with all of the different uh, social structures and all the different connections that you see there. And if you go to the next one, uh, there was a 0.39% chance of an incursion of a disease, parasite, or condition from the ornamental supply chain making it back into the ocean. So. There are uh, some yellow lines on this figure on the left, and these are the kind of behaviors of risk or of note that were of interest to me and to regulators here in the country. These are hobbyists trading with other hobbyists. These are retailers tra trading with other retailers, and these are hobbyists trading back with businesses up the supply chain. So if there are any uh, diseases, 
Uh, these are where diseases could spread not only to the people on their own level, but back up the supply chain, say from a hobbyist to a retailer. Hey, I'm going on vacation. Store, can you please watch my animals? The store will say, sure. Uh, yep, I'll do that for you. Not to think that potentially this hobbyist could have diseased animals. And then all of these uh, business and hobbyist survey respondents uh, were found to actually, they admitted that they release animals into the wild. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this is that chance where not only the animals, but their diseases, uh, whether they're, they're actively diseased or they're just an asymptomatic carrier, uh, these diseases, conditions, parasites can then make you back into the ocean. So that's how those numbers were found. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll touch a little bit on uh, what is biosecurity. I know we're, we'll hear about that uh, maybe some other times today. Uh, but the three major uh, kind of points of biosecurity that we need to make sure that we're looking at are animal biosecurity. This is when you're buying stock, you want to make sure that you're getting the healthiest stock and optimizing the health of the animal you have. Um, and when you have that animal, you want to make sure that you're preventing and reducing and eliminating the pathogens that the animal has. And then you need to be making sure that... Um, as far as the people in your facility, this is usually just you, but if you work at a store, this is these are your, uh, your employees and potentially the people coming into your store that you're educating and managing uh, yourself, your family, your staff, and all your visitors. And uh, some points I wanna share with you now are about kind of the things I go through when I try to uh, make sure that I have a good quarantine system and good biosecurity. I'll harp on these uh, points right here, which include your first two tanks or your first two plus tanks uh, what you should be looking for through your workflow, your hardware, your sources, your stress, and your resources, uh, some of which are actually from the University of Florida, which we just heard from uh, the Ruskin lab earlier. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And I kind of got rid of a lot of my animations here. Uh, but my first point I want to make is there's no such thing as your first aquarium. There's only your first two aquariums because you need that quarantine tank right from the beginning. Yeah. Initially, when you buy your first animals, you may not need the quarantine tank because your only tank would be your quarantine tank. But as soon as those first animals pass through quarantine, you want to make sure that then you have an, an additional tank uh, with those uh, for those new animals that you buy. Go to the next slide. And there's a, a, a pun on the left. It's my biggest fear is that when I die, my wife will sell my corals for what I told her they cost. And this is true for whether or not you're a man or a woman or that your other partner is a man or a woman. Because why is that funny? We're putting a lot of money and time and investment into our tanks, and we need to make sure we're protecting. So we do need a quarantine tank. We need to be quarantining animals uh, for at least 30 days at the same temperature and salinity and preferably even the same water uh, through a certain workflow as your main display. You need to be able to protect your assets. Uh, and so we'll go to the next slide here. We have a photo of Ben. He's a hobbyist here in Queensland. Uh, we need to have workflows for just when it's just you. We need to have workflows for your tank or your facility when it's uh, two people. When you have that guest or that tank sitter that's coming uh, to look after your tank while you're on vacation. And uh, we need to make sure we have an emergency workflow. Oh, my gosh. Right now, Mark is going through an emergency. Not only does he have this going on, but he, his tank has been without power now for what, like 12 hours? And he's mm -hmm. having to manage his tank and manage this workflow. And we need to make sure that during all these workflows, we have an all in, all out strategy. So when we put an animal or 10 animals into quarantine, none of them can be released until they're all released. We don't want to be potentially putting new animals in while the other animals are, quote, in quarantine. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't make sense. We need to make sure we have all in, all out. We'll go to the next sli slide here. So for all of your workflow goals, you need to make sure that your workflows uh, prevent disease transfer between your aquarium systems. We need to be working with healthy uh, and the most cherished animals first. That way we're not accidentally bringing disease along with us. And then we need to be more moving on to the quarantine systems. We don't want to be moving uh, back and forth. For example, right. if you go to the next slide, uh, we're going to be using the old water from the water changes from your main display and adding them into your quarantine. You know, then actually those animals in your quarantine will be used to your display water. We need to be washing our hands and our arms between working with your main display and then your quarantine system. We don't want to be transferring anything uh, back and forth. And we need to make sure that we have separate hardware uh, from your, your main display and your quarantine tank or tanks. All of your tanks need um, all different uh, hardware. Now we'll go to the next slide. Uh, we need to make sure that everyone is thinking about biosecurity and quarantine and they're planning to make sure that they, they're biosecure uh, and that we're acting biosecurely. And we need to be setting up the procedures in place. And for example, this was at the home store. This, uh, this couple had a store in their, um, in their garage and they parked their car in there when the store wasn't open. Uh, it wasn't the most bio, uh, biosecure facility, for example, and people were able to kind of 
uh, oftentimes they would reach in and grab things. Um, so some things we can do is we can have forums and checklists and procedures in place to make sure um, that we are uh, doing everything every day. We need to be thinking about biosecurity planning and we can be acting it. So on the next uh, slide here, uh, there's a couple of different checklists and procedures. Uh, this first one is from my old lab. It was a daily checklist. These are things I need to do every day when I walk in. I had volunteers, I had students helping me. So there's a column for morning, afternoon, and evening. You can feel free to use some of these. These are things that we had to look at every day or potentially three times a day if they're in every column. If you go to the next one, this is an individual tank observation form. Um, this is for one tank over time. So this is the week of whatever, it's tank number or whatever. I, it may or may not have these diseases. What species is in there? What are the water quality items over time? All sorts of things. So you need to make sure that you have all these uh, checklists in place. We'll go to the next slide. This is the water quality of that tank on, a on every tank on a certain day. Hey, what is the water quality across all of my systems? You know, a lot of times now we have an app for this, uh, but we need to make sure that we're recording all of this so that we can go back in time and make sure that we know what this uh, uh, what problems we might have been having and uh, what the water quality was. And finally, there is a copy of, uh, if you go to the next one, it's a zoomed out copy of a biosecurity plan I had for my lab. Um, so, and including, you can see their screenshots of a biosecure area sign I had to have on my door. But, you know, Mark, you have a fish tank room behind your main display. Right. I hope you have some sort of signage so that if you have guests come over, that, you know, potentially they're not fully trusted. And I hope that the majority of your guests understand that they shouldn't be in your fish tank room if you don't want them to be. Uh, but potentially say, hey, you know, not biosecure area, but quarantine area or, you know, high risk area or something like that. Make sure you have a procedure uh, in place. I don't have the signs, um, but well, I could print this out and staple them to the door for you. <laughs> for when you Yeah, there it. we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so the most important though. thing. You know, when I do yeah, get most... over, I do see where they're going. I see what their hands yeah. are. I see what they're touching, what they're leaning over. I do look, you know, and you know, most people are super like the, the reef's so beautiful and they don't want to touch anything. They're terrified. So it works out really well. Oh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we'll go to, we'll go to the next sec, uh, next slide okay. uh, and we'll hit advance again. Uh, okay. So this is a work, uh, this is a, uh, oh, a people sorry. flow. Again, no, that's where I want to be on that, on that graphic. Oh, you do. Okay. Uh, so this is just a, yep. This is just a flow of kind of how people can move through a facility. So if you have more than just your tank in an open, do in an open room, and you need to think about not only how your animals are flowing through your quarantine tank uh, and then to your, your main display, but you need to think about how the people and the animals. So you don't want your brand new fish potentially entering right into your retail area or into your main display area. You want to make sure that these animals have no chance of making it into the potentially healthier space of your store or of your display. So you want the animals and the people to enter in and out of the quarantine area, have that biosecure, those quarantine uh, procedures in place, have a hand wash station, a foot bath, a hospital area, as you see here, it says optional. And then those people can move back and forth uh, from that foot bath into the retail area and then uh, the animals and the people can leave through the, the store. And signage, like I said, there's a couple different uh, suggestions of signage here. Uh, if you hit next mark, you can see a quarantine area, access restricted to authorized personnel only. If you hit uh, uh, forward again, this is, you know, please use the foot bath or the hand wash. If you hit forward again, please only use the equipment specific to the similarly identified tanks. Mm -hmm. You hit uh, forward again, uh, all equipment must be sanitized. You know, these are things that you might learn that those signs are there, but they're a constant reminder that these things need to be done. Uh, so those are some signs you can have in place. I'll go on to hardware next. Uh, if you hit next, I'll, I'll prep this. So uh, during my PhD, like I mentioned, I was able to survey the businesses and hobbies of Australia. And so I asked them a bunch of questions. This is question 21 for the businesses and 48 for the hobbyists. And I asked, which of the following precautions does your business or you as a hobbyist take to ensure that your marine ornamental organisms organisms remain healthy. And so I asked them, uh, you can read the, the figure captions there, there's an error rate, and you can see that uh, red is never, pink is rarely, gray is unsure, uh, light blue is most of the time, and blue is always. I'm sorry for colorblind, but Mark's got the first one there. Um, this is for businesses. The majority of businesses are using uh, UV, and then that second one down is, you know, uh, the majority are are always or most of the time using unique equipment for every tank and system. Mm -hmm. This is important to know when you go into a store. Hey, what are you using? Look at their systems. Are you are they do they have like one net for every tank, fresh and salt? You know that's a bit concerning. Are they using ozone? Are they using uh, UV? 
Um, are they doing quarantine? If you go to the next one there, Mark, this is for hobbyists. Uh, this is uh, across uh, 265 hobbyists. It represents the Australian aquarium industry in 2015 at a 6% air rate. About half were washing their hands between interacting with different systems. Mm -hmm. About a quarter will always, or most of the time, uh, using unique equipment. Uh, about maybe 20% are using UV, and it goes down from there. There's a lot of red, not a lot of blue for those uh, for those hobbyists. So yeah. that gives you an idea of what Australians uh, are doing, uh, businesses and hobbyists, and um, what you should be doing potentially as well. I'll get into a little bit more of the hardware, Mark, if you click on to the next one. Uh, you should have equipment for every system, like we said. You should be uh, washing your hands. You should be using o UV or ozone. Uh, if you're a big facility and you're dumping a lot of water in it, potentially like the, uh, the University of Florida Ruskin Top Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory that we heard from earlier, they have sick fish on facility. They need to be treating their wastewater. They can't just be dumping all that fish disease and fish wastewater um, into the, the uh, local sewer system. And if you're shipping animals, you need to have uh, a whole bunch of procedures in place as well. We'll go into one aspect of the UV. We don't have a lot of time right now, uh, but if you click there, uh, I'm if you click twice. Um, you can see a whole bunch of different things uh, for UV. So um, you can be using UV to treat uh, freshwater and marine uh, parasites, bacteria, funguses, viruses. Uh, hit uh, next one more time there, Mark. And so on the left, you have kind of um, what you can be doing as far as uh, the unit here, if you guys aren't familiar with uh, with UV, these are microwatt seconds per centimeter squared. So this is how much energy from a UV lamp is hitting uh, a, a square centimeter per second uh, or, or within a second. And so there's all sorts of different dose rates there. On the left, it's the, the y-axis on that figure. On the right, it's that column down the middle, those numbers that are in the tens or hundreds of thousands of units. Uh, but if you hit next one more time, Mark, you'll see when you're looking at a UV box, Mm -hmm. and you see what UV model you have. Mm -hmm. For this one, that little black box is filled in. It says for 472 gallons per hour, you get a dose rate of 30,000 microwatt seconds per centimeter squared. And they suggest that that's enough to kill algae and bacteria. And if you slow down that flow rate uh, mm -hmm. for the UV, you can get a dose rate of up to 180,000 microwatt seconds per centimeter squared. And that's enough to kill protists according to this manufacturer. But I would say if you're trying to target something specifically, uh, look at some of the resources uh, for UV, and that way you can try to figure out your flow rate for your tank and figure out what UV rate is appropriate for your uh, your system. And for those of you who aren't familiar with UV, if you click next again, Mark, uh, you're, we're dosing UVC. Uh, and so when we have UV lights on our tanks, for example, that's usually UVA. Um, I would still not look at those UVA lights. It kind of does a number on my eyes as well, but um, mm. never look at a UVC uh, lamp. Uh, mm. Sometimes there's a little window that you can just make sure that the light bulb is on and you're not inadvertently electrocuting your tank, uh, but we don't want to be looking at that. Um, another thing we can do is we can use bleach to, uh, to clean all of our hardware. So if you click next there, uh, here are some uh, bleach, bleach dilution rates if you're interested. Um, there's lower concentrations of bleach from two to 500 parts per million are usually enough to kill bacteria, funguses, and most viruses. Um, and so if you're, you just have uh, like home bleach at home, just look at the concentration of that sodium hypochlorite uh, on the left there, and you can dilute it down to what might be needed. And, and then again, one more time, this is a, an older uh, slide now. I believe this is from 2011. Uh, if you go to the next one, Mark, um, this is from the University of Iowa, their Center of Food Security and Public Health. I believe they have a newer table than this now. But on the top, we have all different types of disinfectants. And then in the, uh, I guess, basically that orangey color across the bottom, we have everything that we might want to be targeting uh, mm -hmm. with different types of disinfectants. Uh, and so, for example, if you have an alcohol or you have a quaternary ammonia compound, um, you can see which one is affected. So if you are a big, huge commercial facility and you have to go buy a disinfectant, and let's say you're trying to target uh, a bacteria or you're trying to target a fungus, you would look at a table like this to try to figure out what you might need. Mm -hmm. um, the next point I want to hit on is making sure that the sources of your animals are correct. So if you click onto the next slide, you need to make sure that your source of animals is safe. So this is Adrian. This is a funny slide because Adrian was teaching us how to frag back in 2012 at a local aquarium uh, meeting we had here in Australia. But we need to make sure that our animals are basically from a a biosecure or a quarantine or a healthy source. And we need to know about the source of those animals. Um, how long and how many links did it take for 
that animal to be collected to make it to you. Every additional link is a chance for those animals to be carrying a disease. Um, do you trust them? Is your animal being fed? If so, what kind of feed is that animal been fed along the way? Um, as Richard Ross would say is be skeptical about your animal sources and, mm -hmm. and, and ask a lot of questions, both at the store and then of where the store gets their, uh, their animals from. Yeah. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, we'll go into the sources uh, from my PhD if you click uh, next twice. Um, this is just the proportion of business respondents, uh, respondents that uh, basically I said, hey, do you tell the person who buys your fish uh, that they were sick? Um, and so the store said that they 30% uh, they never tell the people who buy their fish or, or their coral that it, that that animal had been sick in the past. That's right. quite concerning. Um, that is a chance for that disease or parasite or condition to be passed on, and you can you can add up the most uh, of the time and always there, but it's about I think about 68% of the stores that I surveyed most of the time are always told the store. So that's good, but th they shouldn't maybe be the ones responsible. You should be asking, and if you click again, Mark. You'll see the hobbyists there. The hobbyists are supposedly like 50 plus 20 percent, so 70 percent of the time. Most of the time are always telling other hobbyists uh, that the fish or core that they're giving the hobbyist, uh, the other hobbyist or the store is sick. So um, if you're getting something off of someone in your club, uh, make sure that, um, that the animals are sick uh, or the animals have been sick or haven't been sick and kind of one of the last time they were potentially treated as well. Uh, so we need to make sure that the animals remain stress-free as well. So if you go to the next slide, Mark, there's all sorts of, uh, sources of stress. Uh, for example, here, they could be stressed from shipment. They could be stressed from acclimation. They can be stressed from quarantine. Let's say the power goes out after a storm in, in, uh, <laughs> central, in, in central Texas, uh, and uh, even though you have a generator, the, the temperature of your house changes. So these are all signs and sources of stress. Um, and predators, do you add a new big fish or you add another coral right next to your current coral? Uh, it's going to be uh, feeling all sorts of stress that you, you may not think about. If you hit next again, these are puns, right? Um, these are potentials of stress. I don't know how to tell you this, but you don't have a fish anymore. That's a stressor. Check your pH and check it often, right? This is a source of stress for your animals, the pH. Uh, aquarium needs top off, it uses tap water. That's a source of stress. Uh, you say you do water, uh, water changes regularly. Our test re results determined that was a lie. You know, your, your coral is not the father, but yeah, that is a sign of stress. Um, I'll go into resources here briefly. Uh, we had uh, uh, Travis on earlier. He was giving that video tour uh, of the University of Florida. They have great reference material there at the University of Florida Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Uh, many of their current and, um, and past employees have written great articles. Uh, so you can go to the IFAS extension, look at the University of Florida, and there are hundreds of, of articles there for you. Um, if you hit next twice there, Mark, um, there is not only the ISBNs, uh, but the, the cover uh, photos, so the covers of some of the, uh, the books that I recommend. You have Aquaculture Biosecurity, you have aquatic systems engineering, both uh, issues one and two. And then you have design and operating guide for aquaculture seawater systems, second edition. You know, if you want good material to read on an airplane, uh, let's say, uh, or you're flying to a conference or you're just sitting on a, a stationary bike in the gym, I kid you not, I have sat and read the aquatic systems engineering back uh, front cover to back cover multiple times while working out on a, a stationary bike. It is great reading if you're an aquarium hobbyist. You'll love it. Also here in Australia and also available to the world uh, is Dr. Lowe, if you hit next one more time, and Dr. Rob Jones. Uh, you can go to their websites. Uh, they have great resources. And Dr. Dr. Rob Jones and his team now um, at theaquariumvet.com have uh, great courses that you can take um, online as well. And to wrap things up on this presentation, if you go to the next slide, remember, be skeptical and trust nobody. Uh, trust no one. Uh, there's no more slide. Oh, there it is. It wouldn't go. No, oh, there it is. <laughs> it wouldn't go. Sorry, maybe there was a hidden thing there. But um, yeah. you don't even trust Richard Ross. Yeah. yeah. He's, <laughs> he would tell you firsthand, be skeptical and trust no one. Uh, quarantine everything, your coral, your macroalgae, uh, the fish, your sand. Uh, have a unique uh, equipment for every system. Sterilize yourself. And I would say put UV in all systems. Um, and just... Uh, you hit twice next there. These are uh, two case studies from my PhD. On the left, we have a case of uh, cryptocarrion irritans uh, on a lionfish. This was a lionfish that was allowed uh, into the country as, quote, being healthy. And then the, uh, the, the employee of the store realized really quickly that, um, oh, wow, it has, it has cryptocarrion or I think 
colloquially known as ick, but uh, mm-hmm. it's cryptocarrion. And if you hit next one more time, uh, this was a clownfish that was allowed into the country uh, that has a uh, lymphocystis. So this one en- ended up was behaving normally. Uh, and then unfortunately uh, had so many tumors on its mouth, they couldn't eat anymore. And that was yeah. sent to me as part of my PhD. Uh, so we'll just uh, blast through the contact information because I have another presentation to give you guys about uh, my new job. But if you need to contact me, you can go to my website there or find me on X, aka Twitter, or you can find me on Mastodon. And for this presentation, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, all the people that you see there. Uh, Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And I will look at that uh, and we'll go to the next presentation, please. That was a lot of information. I do have to admit. I know, good thing it's recorded. (laughs) I I do have to admit I yawned, but that's because I got two hours sleep. That's all right. You know what, Mark? You guys, if you're not subscribed already, make sure you click subscribe. Uh, Smush like, do all the things, hit the notification bell. Um, Yeah, yeah, because Mark's been doing this for longer than I've been around. And uh, (laughs) Mark helped me uh, 15, 20 years ago when I was like, wait. And then I was like, I think I was reading your website one day, and I was like, you know, I should go to Magna. And and then look what happened, right? Oh, it was it was crazy. All right, next presentation. Aims and refrustration. So I just did a costume change. I put on my AIMS shirt. I now work at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, uh, where I am the RRAP in- Industry Development Lead. Uh, and so thank you very much there. If you hit next, Mark, um, at the uh, Australian Institute of Marine Science, uh, we acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as traditional owners in the places where AIMS works, uh, both on the land and sea country of uh, tropical Queensland and, uh, and Australia. We pay respects to their elders past, present, and future, and their continuing culture, beliefs, and spiritual relationships and connection to the land and sea. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. We'll hit next. So at AIMS, the Australian Institute of Marine Science, if you guys aren't familiar, uh, we are the Tropical Marine Biology Agency uh, of Australia. We work from Ningaloo Reef in the west all the way across the top of Australia uh, to the Great Barrier Reef uh, here on the east coast. And our commitment is to deliver marine research that improves ocean health, Uh, protects coral reef from climate change, and this creates an economic, social, and environmental benefits for all Australians. You'll see a lot of pictures. I'm not going to reference many of them, but uh, take a look and see all the beautiful things. Some of them I will acknowledge. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, AIMS is Australia's Marine Tropical Research Agency, like I said, and our goal is to support the sustainable use and the protection of our oceans. And we do that, and we apply uh, science-based solutions to the key challenges facing those who live and work in the waters of Northern Australia. You could see one of our research there, uh, boats there next to uh, the reef. Uh, just to let you guys kind of get a better idea of where I am, if you click north, uh, next there, sorry. Um, mm-hmm. We have a picture of Australia there on the left. Um, mm-hmm. Many of you kind of are familiar with the shape of Australia. Right now I'm actually in my friend's uh, living room on vacation uh, in Sydney in the bottom right. Uh, but I normally live up in Townsville where I'm heading tonight. Uh, in that uh, yellow circle there, uh-huh. um, and the Great Barrier Reef is just uh, out to sea. So if you guys have been interacting with me for the last uh, 10 or 11 years, that's where I've been living for most of that time. Uh, we'll go back to Ames here now. You click Next. Um, Ames is uniquely placed, like you saw there on the picture, to provide the expert advice and R&D systems required to help preserve our marine estate. And you can see many of our aquariums there in the Sea Sim. If you hit Next, please, Mark, I'll talk a little bit more about the Sea Sim. This is the National Sea Simulator. Some of you have heard about this. Uh, it gives AIMS researchers and their collaborators the edge to deliver world-leading coral reef science. Um, you can see some of the pictures there that this facility allows us to manipulate key environmental factors, including light, temperature, acidity, carbon dioxide, salinity, and sediments and, and contaminants in the water for each individual tank uh, that we have. So in that room on the top right, that's one of our experimental rooms where we can manipulate all those parameters for every individual tank. If you hit next there, Mark, uh, we just turned 10. The CSIM did at least. The CSIM just turned 10. It opened in 2013 with a $37 million grant uh, from the Education Investment Fund in Ames. And in 2021, we announced that we were expanding the CSIM. Uh, so we're, we're more than doubling the capacity of the CSIM here. Uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, grow a lot more coral and do a lot more experiments. So I'll tell you now a little bit more about the tech uh, involved with all of the aquariums in the National Sea Simulator. You hit next. Um, every room really pretty, is a, I know, isn't it? It it's so it's beautiful. It, yeah. It's just, oh, guys, it's it's a geeky, aquarium <laughs> geek's not uh, amazing. Just like, oh, this I, one. Yeah, it, wow. I know, right? Keep going, oh, keep going. Uh, <laughs> yeah, every, every room is a controlled environmental room. You, know, you can have positive or negative air pressure. It's all sorts of craziness. Uh, we use all sorts of tech. So in that bottom left is the schematic of the 
of the current CSIM before we're expanding it. On the bottom right there, a photo from Christian. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of our, our techs uh, using the SCADA system, the controller uh, software, yeah. to make sure that the flow and the water quality parameters for experimental tanks are all correct. And so, you know, you guys really want to know all the details. So I, I have provided the details for you here on the next slide. So, Mark, we have 43 seawater pumps. Okay. Uh, 14 of those are processing pumps. They're they're filtering the water. They're taking the water from the ocean up to our water treatment facility. And we have 29 pumps in the building. And we're doing 3 million liters of seawater a day. That's about 750,000 gallons a day. Wow. And so we're, we're filtering the seawater down to 0 0.04 microns mm. to ensure a consistency and high quality of water. We have separate lines that are also able to deliver raw seawater. And we have real-time water quality monitoring that alerts all of our texts, no matter where they are, via text message. Uh, and many of them are on call 24 seven. So thank you so much to them for providing clean water quality. So our scientists that we have there on the right uh, can do all of the experiments. So uh, we can, well, if it's a rain event or if it's super low tide, we have the ability to hold all sorts of seawater as well uh, to make sure. If you go to the next one, I'll get into even more details. Is that so we have red stuff spawning or is it red paint yeah, that's in the biosecure that's building? Coral spawn. <laughs> no, that's, that's coral spawn. That's coral spawn. I'll get into that here in a second. Yeah. And that's one of our PhD students, Rachel, they're collecting coral spawn. So uh, where are we at? Yeah, so we have uh, ambient temperature filtered seawater. So what's, that is kind of whatever it is in the ocean, but we can manipulate the temperature between 15 and 40 degrees Celsius. So I think that's like 59 degrees Fahrenheit to like 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. um, and we can add CO2 to that and we can mix CO2 and air and we can uh, manipulate the water uh, temperature to 0.1 degree uh, Celsius with 0.19 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for anybody in the freedom units. Um, and then we have a uh, state of the art uh, lighting <laughs> freedom units. Yeah, we have state of the art lighting, uh, uh, which has been built in house to control the lighting for every uh, tank as well. Uh, I'll go a little bit now into Australia's coral reefs. Uh, a lot of you guys have heard um, a little bit about that in the past. So many of you are familiar, you can go to the next slide. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef and the reefs globally are facing uh, enormous pressures uh, with increasing frequency, widespread uh, and severe disturbances. And so many of those that you guys know of are the cyclones, we call them down here, you call them uh, hurricanes and thermal stresses, which can lead to uh, mass coral bleaching. If you go to the next, uh, next picture there or the next slide there, um, we have a long-term data uh, monitoring uh, program here, and it's been collecting data since uh, the 1980s. Mm. Uh, and so we have been able to show that through these multiple disturbances that we can quantify and measure the recovery of the reef. You can see some of our researchers out there uh, doing that. Uh, many of them will be diving uh, tens, if not hundreds of times a year, uh, collecting all this data for us. Uh, there are, uh, you go to the next slide. Um, a lot of our uh, long-term monitoring shows that the Great Barrier Reef is resilient. It can recover uh, from these disturbances, but you need to be giving it enough time. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the likely consequences of climate change will lead to the shortening of these recovery windows. And it's not, it's not yet clear if the coral has enough time or the ability to adapt to these ever kind of decreasing uh, units of time where they can recover. Uh, so there you can see more photos of our, of our researchers. And so every uh, year now, I believe, we release an annual summary. If you go to the next uh, slide there, and we've got some uh, notifications there on the bottom. Um, every year we release an annual uh, summary. So if you want to go read our most recent summary, uh, you can. You can find that on Ames's website. Uh, but there's been a small decrease, unfortunately, in the coral cover in the north and central and southern parts of the region. Uh, and this latest report that we've released about our long-term monitoring uh, paints a complex picture of reefs. And uh, they're continuing to recover, but... Um, it's kind of difficult with uh, the offset of coral loss on other reefs. So uh, most reefs in this past year underwent little change in coral cover, unlike in previous years. Mm -hmm. And we'll do the next slide. So the likely consequences of climate change, particularly more frequent and marine uh, heat waves, will lead to these shortening windows um, of recovery. And the gains in recent years that we had in previous, uh, in the last two and three years that you might have heard in, in, the, uh, in the media, um, they were encouraging, but uh, a lot of coral can be lost, lost in a short amount of time, like we're seeing right now in the Caribbean. Um, and so recently, Ames has been working to develop new tools to help the reefs uh, for the future adapt and recover to the effects of climate change. Um, our scientists, to be hit next, our scientists are continuing uh, our research to understand kind of what we can do to help these coral reefs adapt to the warming oceans. And so we're investigating ways that uh, we enhance coral reefs ability to re, uh, resist bleaching 
and developing our methods and scaling these methods up to fast track coral recovery. And so this is the effort I work in now. Uh, it is called RRAP. If you go to the next slide, RRAP stands for the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program. And so we're a global leader in uh, coral reef restoration and adaptation research. Uh, so we're bringing together not only Australian, but international experts like myself uh, to create an innovative suite of solutions to protect, uh, restore, and to build more resilient reefs. So this is not just AIMS, the Australian Institute of Marine Science where I work, uh, but it's a partnership between uh, AIMS, the Australian Government Reef Trust, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, uh, CSIRO, uh, James Cook University, Queensland University of Technology, Southern Cross University, and the University of Queensland. And now I'll get into my RRAP presentation. Uh, so what is RRAP? If you hit next. Yep. And next again. So RRAP, like I mentioned, is a consortium of dedicated uh, people uh, dedicated to the uh, creating an, an innovative toolkit and a safe, acceptable interventions to help the reef resist, adapt to, and recover from the impacts of climate change. So these photos on the right you might there aren't only of AIMS, whereas this one is our outdoor mesocosm, uh, mesocosm system. Um, and so we're doing the research at Ames and other facilities. Uh, the results of these interventions are going to be needed not only in Australia, but around the world. Uh, and we need to be looking at other things like reducing global greenhouse emissions uh, to make sure that we have the best chance uh, in the future. Hit the next slide. Um, so not only does it require our best minds, but it requires the input from traditional owners, uh, reef communities, uh, industries and the wider Australian public for this project. Uh, so my role within within our app is to involve the industry. And we'll go to the the next uh, the next point there. We'll go to the the five points for the project. Uh, the, excuse me, the, excuse me, the five program aims. Um, so the first aim is to provide reef managers with a suite of scientifically proven, ecologically effective, socially eff excuse me, socially acceptable, technically feasible, and economically viable options to intervene at scale on the reef. So the problem globally is that uh, there is all of these challenges and there aren't, a, there aren't enough organizations and there isn't enough funds available uh, to, to do all of this. So here at RRAP, we're trying to be the ones that can go through and provide reef managers, not only in Australia, but around the world, all these different options. And if you go to uh, slide two there, and the second aim is to resolve the complexities around the choices. So whether they're environmental, ecological, economical, or so social implications, and then to provide strategies to find the safest and most effective path uh, going forward and go to three. While we're doing all of this, it's really important that we engage the traditional owners and the different community groups so that the, so that their interests are acknowledged and also that, so they're co-designing and developing everything along with us. And we'll go to the fourth and the fifth point there. Uh, the program aims basically one, we working with the reef managers and we're working with climate mitigation in mind and that we're just supporting the deployment of at scale integration. That's where my team comes in. We'll get to that shortly. So our app is about 350 people. If you hit next there, Mark, um, it's comprised of a series of complementary sub programs. And these are these uh, vertical columns that you see there. And we'll get into some of those now. And then I'm part of one of these cross-cutting and engineering sub-programs. So I'm part of that translation to deployment. So I think in total, it's like 300 or so people. We have scientists working at all these different organizations. And then we have all these cross-cutting uh, support uh, groups as well, including the translation to deployment. If you guys want to find out more about uh, our app, you can go to GBR Restoration. If you, you hit next there, Mark, uh, gbrrestoration.org. And then you can click on or you can hover over all of the uh, the menus there at the top. Now, this screenshot was from a week ago. I know our, our PR person loves to constantly update the website. So if it doesn't look like this anymore, don't be alarmed. We're, <laughs> we're going under a, they're undergoing a brand a redesign as well. So gbrrestoration.org is where you want to go. Awesome. So I'm going to get into a couple of those uh, sub programs now. The first one I want to talk about um, is the enhanced coral uh, corals and treatments. If you hit next. Um, so this is run by uh, Lena Bay and Andre Andrea. And so we're mapping the reef genome. We're developing uh, breeding methods and treatments to enhance the resilience and the thermal tolerance of corals. And we're trying to determine uh, the benefits and trade-offs of, uh, of enhancing bleaching tolerance. So I have some videos I, I'm gonna show you guys. Uh, so Mark, if you hit next twice, it should auto play. And I hope the audio is there and I'm gonna be quiet because there's a couple of videos.
The Great Barrier Reef is under threat from climate change. Climate change warms ocean waters and heat waves on top of this gradual warming results in mass bleaching. Mass bleaching significantly impacts coral health and can result in mortality if intense or prolonged. Reef restoration and adaptation are proposed tools to help corals adapt and respond to climate change. Here at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, we're addressing critical knowledge gaps to understand how corals are responding to temperature stress. The first step in our research program is to understand how corals vary in their temperature tolerance and how this plays out across the reef and in the context of rates of warming and the heat anomalies that we're experiencing. Once we understand the mechanisms that underpin heat tolerance, we can work on enhancing this trait from generation to generation. So our primary objective is to increase the thermal tolerance of corals. Um, the way we do this is by focusing on coral symbionts. So corals are animals that have symbiotic algae that live inside their tissues. So you can think of these as sort of the solar cells of corals. So the sunlight comes down, the corals and the algae capture it together. But the thing is that the symbionts can actually define the upper thermal limit of corals. And so we are focusing on improving the tolerance of the symbionts. Um, so we can grow the symbionts in the lab. We grow them for many years at elevated temperatures and we supply those symbionts back to the coral. And then the idea is that is the thermal tolerance we've been able to give the algae in the lab conferring thermal tolerance to the coral here. Addressing critical knowledge gaps in the heat tolerance and evolution of corals support both existing and novel management actions. This will help protect and enhance the recovery and adaptation of reefs to the impacts of climate change. And I hope that came through all right. We'll continue on here. The next uh, sub-program I want to talk, talk to you about is the Coral Aquaculture and Development Program. This is also run by Nina Bay and Andrea. And so their, their job is to scale up uh, the methods for mass aquaculture. So I was just looking in chat during that video. Yes, we're going to be able to put corals back onto the reef. And so right now for this next season, it's like the fourth or fifth day or the 10th day now of spring here in Australia. Uh, so this summer or AKA this uh, Christmas season, uh, and we're going to be doing a field run of about uh, 10 to 20,000 coral. Um, and my goal and my job is to scale this up from tens to hundreds of thousands to tens or hundreds of millions of coral, not only with the continuation with the R&D, uh, but with the help of industry to help us scale all this up. So right now we're doing all of this R&D so that we can kind of figure out how to do it. So we have mass aquaculture and settlement devices. And if you hit uh, next there again and maybe next there again, the video will play for the CAD team. Thank you. Second. There's actually two videos. You hit back once. I'm trying to get That's the video audio two. to go back. on. I'll uh, go back. Go back again. Okay. That's the second video. <clears throat> it will come on. It doesn't come on for the um, acknowledgement of country. Okay. Hit back once. Yeah, there we go. And forwards, maybe. <laughs> Guys, let's have a round of applause and hit smash like for Mark because doing this live is, is amazing. The Great Barrier Reef is under threat from climate change. Climate change warms ocean waters and heat waves on top of this gradual warming results in mass bleaching. Mass bleaching significantly impacts coral health and can result in mortality if intense or prolonged. Reef restoration and adaptation are proposed tools to help corals adapt and respond to climate change. As part of the reef restoration and adaptation program, we're developing new ways to scale up the breeding and delivery of resilient corals onto the reef through innovative aquaculture techniques. The annual coral spawning event is a really critical time for us here. So what we do is we go out into the field and collect the corals and bring them back here to CSIM. 
Here we spawn them and fertilize them in a large-scale aquaculture facility, therefore producing large-scale larvae and also recruits to support refrigeration and deployment back into the wild. So the first stage of the autospawn idea is to skim off the egg sperm bundles off the surface and collect them in a uh, fertilization vessel. The fertilization vessel breaks up the egg sperm bundles and detects an increase of turbidity in the water due to the sperm being in the water. We are now able to infer the concentration of sperm in the water looking at turbidity and this drives the whole process. Then we hold the fertilization time for the, the optimum sperm concentration and then we flush off the sperm. So at the end of the end of the process, you'll have your two million or three million larvae clean and ready to be stocked in the larval uh, culture tank. Coral seeding is a process where we uh, settle coral larvae onto substrates and then we deploy those substrates much like the way that we sow seeds onto a reef. And this is a way for us to deliver many very small corals in the early stages of life onto a reef to enhance their survival and growth and to hopefully promote the recovery of that reef. So we're also working on projects to um, use bacteria that are naturally associated with corals to see if that can help their health, just like we're using probiotics for human gut health. And we also work on projects to develop diets for use in coral aquaculture and understand the nutritional demands and how we can provide that while in captivity. One of the great challenges that we face is that there's been decades of research on acroporid corals, but they're not the only corals that live on the Great Barrier Reef. It's hugely diverse, there are many species, and so we really need to be able to understand how to aquaculture corals across that broad cross-section of species so that we can maintain that rich diversity, the biodiversity that is inherent on the Great Barrier Reef. Thank you, Mark, and we'll click next to the next video. Yeah, the intros are the same, guys. It's the, the Welcome to Country, and then uh, it goes into different content. So one of the big impediments to coral reef recovery after a disturbance event is the survival of those really small coral larvae that are the early life history stages right after coral spawning. So in nature, less than one in a thousand or maybe even one in a hundred thousand will actually survive to adulthood. And so if we're going to use coral seeding for reef restoration in the future, we really need to find ways to improve those survival rates of the corals that are put out into the field so that they can overcome that, what we're calling a bottleneck in the, the recovery process. One of the things that we're trying to better understand is what drives coral survival in that first year of life and how that differs amongst environments and amongst species. So we are aiming to do a large field deployment where we deploy these corals across multiple environments, across gradients and latitudes and inshore to offshore gradients to really understand how those gradients interact with more fine scale processes on each reef to drive the survival of those larvae. The mortality rate is really high because when they're so small, predation rate is really high, so there's a lot of fish that might accidentally graze them off the reef when they are just having little bites of something around the reef, um, but then they accidentally graze off these recruits. And then they also get very easily overgrown by all sorts of other macroalgae that grow around them or by um, crustose, coralline algae. Because they're just not very big, they're not very competitive, and only when they reach a bigger size they start to be able to compete with all these external drivers. We try to look at to assist them in that very first life stage by all sorts of measures, so by creative engineering solutions or by more biological environmental solutions. For my PhD research, I'll be running an anti-predator experiment looking at how grazing pressure varies along a wave energy gradient. 
So the field work that we're undertaking now is really aimed at trying to understand the who, the what, and the where of coral deployment and coral seeding interventions. So this will allow us to optimize the coral species and the coral devices that we're using to fit the environment that is receiving those corals to basically give us the best bang for our buck with the restoration that we're attempting. Well really we only have one chance a year to do the coral spawning work because they spawn by the lunar cycle once a year in their mass spawning event and so that keeps us going through the long and late nights and uh, 14 nights after the full moon we're still here spawning but that keeps us motivated and energized and because we feel that there's time pressure. Global warming is happening, the reef is experiencing disturbance events frequently and we need to find solutions quickly so that we can address this problem. Thank you very much, Mark. We'll go to the next uh, section here. Someone brought it up in chat. I think it was spoken about earlier. Yes, we're also doing cryopreservation. So one of our uh, six uh, pr sub programs is looking at it. That's uh, down in Sydney at the Taronga Zoo, uh, along with the University of New South Wales. And so the Every, every method and every different group has its own set of challenges. So we're trying to overcome all of these challenges uh, with every different team uh, to make sure that everything is going to be feasible to do everything at scale. And so right now, yes, we can uh, cryopreserve uh, 10, 100, 1,000 corals, but we need to be doing this uh, potentially every day. Uh, and we need to be potentially doing hundreds of thousands of, of egg bundles a day. Uh, so scaling up. Uh, with biobanking and aquaculture support is essential for uh, the cor uh, coral cryopreservation team as well. Um, I think other efforts around the world, if you go to the next slide, Mark, are moving these slicks of spawn across the surface of the water. Uh, and so the Moving Corals team, uh, led by uh, Southern Cross University and CSIRO, uh, they're the ones collecting the spawn, and then they're relocating the spawn uh, in, in a, a container like you see here. And then we're strategically deploying that spawn onto a reef site uh, that potentially needs it. Um, the next slide here is our EcoRap team. Uh, these are the uh, ecology, intelligence, and reef restoration team. They are the ones going out into the field. That photo you see on top there, those are aquariums with LEDs on a boat on the ocean, hmm. right? And so we're not only we're doing this on land, uh, we're doing this at sea as well, because we're not only taking these corals and uh, bringing them into our lab, letting them spawn, collecting the, the spawn, and then settling them, but we're also deploying these corals back out to sea. Uh, so this team uh, is constantly in the field. It, it, I don't know if I've met everyone. I've been at Ames now for six or seven months. Uh, I'm not sure I've met everyone who works in this team yet because they're constantly in the field, uh, but they're doing a great job. And then finally, we have my program. If you click next there, we have the Translation to Deployment subprogram. Uh, so over the next two years, it's the, the T to D program uh, that's going to be uh, ramping up all of these uh, these efforts. We're taking all of the advice and all of the R&D from these scientists and with the help of our um, technologists and our roboticists, uh, my job and the, the team uh, under Dr. Mark Gibbs there, uh, we're all supposed to be helping, uh, we all are helping uh, deploy all of these corals. Uh, so you go to the next job, the uh, next slide there. Uh, you have Dorian, our job is to make it happen. Uh, so our, our T to D, as we call it, focuses on the design of the operationalization opera, opera, of the selected interventions uh, with respect to the regulatory approval, the deployment planning, the traditional owner capacity building, uh, the external participation, which is including in tourism and industry partners, and that's where I come in, in addition to the technical feasibility of it. So here you have uh, Dorian next to uh, cameras that are counting the, the oh, spawn and the quantity and the quality yeah, uh, and so those are waterproof casings around individual cameras that then talk to uh, AI that we've developed to be able to quantify uh, the, the quality of all of the spawn and whether or not it's going to be feasible with That's that cool. uh, quality. If you, hit, if you hit next there, so we also developed the critical paths. So is this going to happen and how do we make it happen into the future? Um, if you hit next, we need to make sure that all of our methods are safe and effective at scale. And we're not going to even attempt to do any of these until we know that it will be safe and effective. And that's what underpins um, all the reef restoration adaptation. That's not only going to happen at the GBR, uh, but we're going to be developing for everyone around the world. And you can hit next there again. Um, we want to be successful in local communities and so that industries and local communities can help scale as well. So under the guidance of reef managers in the future and regulatory uh, regulators in the future, we want to make sure that all these methods 
uh, through my help and the help of other industry partners can can change not only Australia's reef restoration scene, but reef restoration scenes around the world through the methods we're providing. Um, so we're developing the pathways, the engineering of Hit Next, uh, the automation that will enable all of these uh, reef restoration methods to occur, occur. So we have master's students, PhD students, postdocs, uh, people like me, we have uh, techs, everyone is coming together to do everything so that the rest of the world can know how to do it. It's a, it's a pretty amazing place to be, Mark. Um, and finally, our program is is going to be testing small-scale small, small scale deployment now um, and so that we can ramp up all the reef restoration efforts in the future. If you hit next again. And uh, finally, I just want to close by saying if you guys have hit next, um, if you want more information, I know I've been talking now for like an hour straight, uh, but for this section, uh, you can go to gbrrestoration.org. And if you want to be more involved in the future, uh, you can uh, go to gbrrestoration.org and learn about those sub-programs. Um, and then from there, you can find all the different partners. Or if you want to be involved uh, with the AIMS efforts uh, for the RRAP program, uh, you can go to aims.gov.au. We are, we are hiring right now. We have a lot of open positions. Uh, so if you're interested and you have the qualifications, we can hire uh, people in from around the world. Uh, just make sure you read all the terms and conditions of the jobs uh, that are on file. And, and with that, uh, you hit one more time. Next, um, I want to thank you, uh, Mark, for putting on Markna 2023. If you guys want to contact me at work, it's k.erickson at aims.gov.au. And you can find all of AIMS social media stuff there. We, you can even call our front desk. Uh, make sure you call during Australian business hours. But that's the end of me talking. Um, thank you so much. And I've been watching the uh, the chat here. Uh, thank you, Dave, Dave. I think he called me Kev, Kev. Uh, thank you, Mark, <laughs> for being a proponent, not only of, of Magnet in the past, but uh, reef education in general. It's uh, really essential that we, we continue to not only have uh, events like MACNA, but uh, educational reefing events for everyone in the industry, not only in the U.S., but around the world. So, uh, Those you two guys, make sure to hit like really and comment. Really good. That was awesome. Thank you. Very <laughs> Thank much. you. Thank you. I saw a lot of good comments from people. People just really enjoyed it. You have gone over time. Our next speaker has been patiently waiting for 19 and a half minutes, but he wrote me, I'm watching, which made me feel good. I was, Ooh, okay. <laughs> Let me wrap up. I'm going to end this video. Douglas, don't move. You're in the perfect spot. <laughs> and I will be pulling you into the next one because we've got to end this video to start the fresh one with yours. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for putting up with this crazy 24-hour live stream and a house with no electricity. We are somehow surviving up till now. And we still have, I mean, this is speaker number 10 is about to start. We have a total of 24, so we still have a long way to go. By the way, this hour was sponsored by 5-Hour Energy. I had to do it. I had to do it. So thank you guys. I'm hanging up and then look for the next channel to appear. Uh, thank you, Mark. Video to appear.